Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Well, good morning. How are we? Doing all right? Drink that coffee because we're about to party together. Here we go. My name is Adam McIntyre. I am one of the Grow Group coordinators here. I am also on the teaching team. Very excited to be here with you all as we continue in our Resync series. We're going to be jumping around the Bible a bit today. And so the verses will be on the screen behind me. But if you want to follow along and you don't have a Bible, go ahead and raise your hand now. An usher will come down the aisle and bring you one. And if you don't own a Bible, please keep that Bible. We love you. And that is our gift to you. So today we're going to be getting into the heart of the Resync series, the why? Uh, why are we resyncing our lives to line up more uh, with what God has in store for us? It's not just so that we can share in the abundant life that Jesus has to offer, although that is a big part of it. But we resync because we have a role to play in God's story of redemption. We resync so that our very lives bear witness to the risen Christ. So today we're going to be talking about evangelism, how we can share the good news of the gospel in every interaction that we have. But we're going to be talking about evangelism in a way that might be a bit different than what you're used to. For some of you, the word evangelism triggers unpleasant memories of getting yelled at by an angry guy with a bullhorn on your way to a Justin Bieber concert. We all have that memory, right? For others of us, the the introverts, my introvert friends in the room, uh, evangelism, you hear that word and you're just filled with anxiety because you're waiting for that inevitable challenge at the end to go talk to complete strangers at a Starbucks and ask them if they know where they're going to go when they die. Well, don't worry. That's not the direction that we're going in today. Evangelism by God's design is simply that the radical love of those who follow Jesus will convince the world that Jesus is for real. That's why Jesus says in the book of John, the world will know that you are my disciples by your love for one another. And later in the book of John, he says that his disciples should be perfectly unified in their love so that the world may know that my father sent me and loved them. So it's by our radical love and our unity that the world will see that Jesus is for real. But the church in America has a problem and it's a big one. Instead of our radical love convincing the world that Jesus is for real, we have become one of the main reasons for convincing people that he is not real. And this has been backed up by countless studies and surveys done over the past few decades, which shows that people are leaving the church in America in record numbers, particularly young people. And one of the main reasons that is consistently, consistently cited is hypocrisy, the hypocrisy they see in the church. They feel if you don't look or act or talk a certain way, then you're just not going to be welcome here. And how did that happen? How is it that Jesus was a magnet for prostitutes and tax collectors, two of the most despised classes of sinners at that time? And yet now the church in America repels those type of people. Well, I think there's a lot of reasons, uh, but the answer I'm going to give you today, just a heads up, it's going to be a bit of a curveball. Stick with me. I promise it'll make sense at the end. Um, But I'm going to argue that one of the primary reasons is because we don't have a full understanding of the gospel, particularly the main enemy that Jesus came to defeat. We don't understand Satan. And it's going to be difficult for us to share the gospel with others and to do the same works that Jesus did if we don't understand our enemy who is actively working against us. In a 2009 survey done by the Barna Group, they determined that around 60% of Christians don't believe in a literal Satan. And that number sounds high until you consider the fact that, if we're honest, Scripture doesn't have a whole lot to say about who or what Satan is. And the way our culture depicts Satan certainly isn't helping. I I watched The Exorcist when I was way too young. Fortunately, it was the edited-for-TV version, but still, it absolutely horrified me. It was an awful experience. Uh, But my main takeaway from that movie is that uh, the way that you battle Satan and his demons is you get a crucifix and you just scream at them. The power of Christ compels you over and over again, and that'll do it. Uh, This was also highly effective on my little brother anytime he was annoying me. (laughs) And then I had a teacher in the ninth grade who used to blame Satan for everything, particularly her car troubles. 
And Satan must have really had it out for her because he popped her tire at least once a month. And like we probably should have done an exorcism on her car. Uh, but these were the kind of images I had of Satan growing up. So at best, I had a confused idea of who Satan was. And this seems to be par for the course. Some Christians believe in a literal Satan, that he, that he was a literal fallen angel who has a hand in the evil atrocities in the world. Other people believe that Satan is more of a figurative representation of the evil in this world. And other Christians uh, don't believe in Satan at all, literal or figurative. And while scripture might not be quite as clear as we would hope on who or what Satan is, there are some things that we can know about Satan from the Bible. The term Satan is actually a title. It's not a proper name. And it means the adversary or the accuser. And so we find out from scripture that Satan had one very specific purpose, which was to accuse people of their sins. We see this clearly in Revelation 12, 9 through 10. Revelation 12, 9 through 10, it'll also be on the screen behind me here. It says, and the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. So Satan is our accuser. He accuses us day and night, which is a fancy literary way of saying that's all he does. He exists to accuse. And we're not sure exactly what happened, but we know somewhere along the way, Satan rebelled against God choosing his own justice over God's justice. And because of his rebellion, he was cast down to earth where he now reigns as the ruler of this world. And as the ruler of this world, Satan stands as our greatest adversary. He tempts us into sin so that he can then accuse us as being guilty of that sin so that we can then be sentenced to death. That's why 1 Peter 5.8 says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Satan is an enemy that we are helpless against. We have no hope of defending ourselves against on our own. We need a defender. We need a rescuer. We need a savior. And that is where the gospel story begins. First John 3, 8 says, the reason the son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. So Jesus came here, the whole reason he came here was to undo the works of the devil, to stand as a defender for those that he was accusing. And for three years, for the three years of Jesus' recorded public ministry, we can see Jesus and Satan confront each other over and over again, particularly in the lives of suffering people. That's why it says in Acts 10, 38, that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. What did he do with that power? He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil for God was with him. So he was anointed with power to undo the works of the devil by doing good and by healing. So every time that Jesus welcomed someone, loved someone, healed someone, forgave someone, he was undoing the works of the devil. And throughout his ministry, you see him doing things like setting a girl free who had been held in captive, who had been held in bondage by Satan for 18 years. And you see him welcome and love people that the religious elites had accused of being too impure to associate with. And you see him forgive people who were just shackled by the guilt and the shame of their sins that they had been accused of. And for some of you here in this room, this might all be hitting close to home. You might feel like you are constantly under accusation, that you are just drowning in guilt and shame. And just being here might be a lot of work for you because you're having to hide who you truly are. You're afraid that if people saw the real you, that you would not be welcome here, that people would not want you here. And so you pretend because you don't feel worthy and you are afraid of the accusations and the shame and the guilt that would come with being exposed. And my friends, that is the voice of Satan. That is the work of Satan, his work is not to be spooky and pop your tires. His work is to convince you through his accusations that you are not worthy of love, of life, of joy, of peace. And Jesus 
says the same thing to you right now that he said back then in John 12, 31, when he said, now, right now, will the ruler of this world be cast out? Any voice that tells you that you are not worthy, that you are not loved, that you are not welcome, any voice that tries to bury you in guilt and shame, that is the voice of Satan. That is the work of the enemy. And the good news of the gospel is that Jesus came here to destroy those works, to defeat our adversary. And that's exactly what he did. Look at Hebrews 2, 14 through 15. These are two of the most potent verses in all of scripture. If you're a person who likes to memorize scripture, I highly recommend you memorize these two verses. It's pretty much the entire gospel encapsulated in two verses. Here we go, Hebrews 2, 14 through 15. He himself, talking about Jesus, Jesus shared in our humanity. He took on flesh and blood. He was born into this world just like you and I. Why? So that through death, through his death on the cross, through his crucifixion, he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. So Jesus' death on the cross, which at the time looked like defeat, we now know was his victory over Satan. Our adversary used his most powerful weapon on Jesus, and Jesus broke that weapon. Jesus broke death. There used to be two things in this world that were universally true, death and taxes. Well, now it's just taxes, I guess, because death has lost its sting. And all who follow Jesus share in his victory. We are freed from the fear of death because we share in the resurrection of Jesus. We are freed from Satan's accusations of guilt because Jesus has declared us innocent by the power of his blood. And if this is the first time you're hearing about this Jesus, if your typical experience at church has been one of accusation and guilt and shame, please believe me when I tell you that Jesus is your advocate too. That Jesus, that his victory is for you as well. Don't let any accusers try to tell you anything differently. The only thing that you have to do is just say yes to him. Just say, I want your victory to be my victory. That's it. Scripture says that salvation is a free gift of grace, and that's not a trick. Just like any other gift, all you have to do is receive it. Say yes to it. At the end, we're going to pray together, and I'll kind of walk us through what that looks like. And we'll have prayer partners up front just in case you have questions or you want someone to pray with you. But for now, just know that Jesus is your advocate. Jesus is for you. His victory is for you. And for the rest of us, those of us who do follow Jesus, who have said yes to Jesus, Jesus has stripped Satan of his power and he has called us to do the same works that he did. We are called to go out and to undo, to destroy the works of the devil, to push out his kingdom of darkness. How in the world are we gonna do that? Well, Jesus tells us, in John 14, starting in verse 12, Jesus says this, truly, truly, I say to you, truly, truly, pay attention, this is really important. I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. What works that he did? The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. So we are going to do those same works. And even greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. How are we going to do that? Skip down to verse 16. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. That word helper, it's capitalized because he's referring to the Holy Spirit. Just like how God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and with power, we have that same Holy Spirit. We have that same power to go around and to destroy the works of the devil. We have a helper. And actually this Greek word for helper, parakletos, it's better translated as advocate. We have an advocate. So if Satan is the voice of accusation in this world. The Holy Spirit is the exact opposite, the voice of advocacy. And this is a very purposeful contrast. It's not an accident. The work of Satan versus the work of the Holy Spirit. Accusation versus advocacy. And here's the kicker. Accusation versus advocacy is a choice that all of us make every single day. And every interaction that I have I can choose to be the voice of Jesus in this world, 
the voice of the Holy Spirit, the voice of advocacy, or I can choose to be the voice of Satan, the voice of accusation and guilt and judgment. And my fear is that far too often the church, myself included, is a voice of accusation in this world, is a voice of the devil. We have become experts at finger wagging and blame and judgment. And for some reason, we've declared ourselves the moral police and anyone that falls short of our standards, we just bury them in guilt and shame. And that is the work of the devil. And that's why it's so important that we know how our enemy operates in this world because far too often the church, without meaning to, without realizing it, is playing right into his hand. We're doing his work. And then we wonder why people are flocking away. We have to learn to resist the voices of accusation in this world. We have to learn how to become the voice of advocacy. And someone who I think just did such a good job at this was Mr. Rogers. I love Mr. Rogers. He's one of my favorite people. I love reading stories about Mr. Rogers. He was just such a gentle, humble, Christ-like man. A lot of people don't realize that before he had his TV show, he wanted to be a Presbyterian minister, and he went to seminary and everything. And one of my favorite stories, one that's always stuck with me, was of a time when he was fresh out of seminary. <clears throat> and he uh, went and visited a church with his friends while on vacation. And while he was listening to the preacher give his sermon, he had an unexpected uh, epiphany on how the Holy Spirit operates in this world. He said this. He said, during the sermon... I kept ticking off every mistake I thought the preacher was making. Y'all don't do that, right? No. (laughs) So he must have been 80 years old. And when his interminable sermon finally ended, I turned to my friend, intending to say something critical about the sermon. But I stopped myself when I saw tears running down her face. And she whispered to me, he said exactly what I needed to hear. And that was a seminal experience for me because I was judging and she was needing. And the Holy Spirit responded to need, not judgment. And if you are a note taker, that's a great note to jot down. The Holy Spirit responds to need, not judgment. And our world is full of people who need an advocate They don't need another person to tell them how bad and wrong and sinful they are. The world is full of accusers. We have enough accusers. The world needs more advocates. And God does not need your help judging people. He doesn't need another gatekeeper to help help declare who's in and who's out. The only thing God needs from us is for us to share his divine love with others and to serve others exactly like Jesus did. If you look throughout the Gospels, you'll notice that Jesus only brought up the law when he was talking to other Jewish people who were trying to live by that law. Anytime he was talking to non-Jewish people, he never brought up the law. He never accused, he never pointed the finger, he never heaped guilt or shame on those people. Now what he consistently did was he would see a need and then he would meet that need. He would befriend people, love people, welcome people, heal people. He ultimately died for them and for us as our advocate. And that is our blueprint for evangelism. It's not about fancy arguments and it's not about scaring people with the threat of hell until they sign on the dotted line. It's about seeing the needs in others and then meeting those needs. And when you do that, when you meet the needs of others, just watch how the Holy Spirit will begin to work to transform and to breathe life into that person. I know because that's exactly what happened to me. A lot of you, if you've heard me speak before, you've heard my story. But for those who haven't, I'll give you a quick rundown. I was uh, was raised in a very, very loving household. I have amazing parents. It was a Christian household. We went to church almost every single week, a lot of times, multiple times a week. And I, I went to a Christian high school where I studied the Bible every single day. And even with all that, I just could not stand the church. I couldn't stand it. I couldn't stand Christianity. Uh, and there were a lot of reasons for that. A lot of them were just my own personal hangups. But the evangelism that I experienced growing up definitely played a part in it. Hellfire seemed to be the only motive for sharing the good news with others. Um, I remember I had a Bible teacher in high school. He was teaching about evangelism. And he was going on and on and on about hell. And me, 
being kind of a punk and very much a contrarian, I raised my hand. I said, well, what if there is no hell? To which he got furious. He flipped a switch and he's like, well, if there's no hell, then what's the point of not sinning? Anyone can run around doing whatever they want all the time without consequences. The world would be in chaos. And what his answer told me is that the life of sin is actually better than the life that Jesus offers. And that the only reason that we don't sin is out of fear of hell. Sin is the party, not the kingdom. And so for that and a lot of other reasons, when I got to college, I gave up my faith. It wasn't real to begin with, but I gave it up. And I didn't miss it at all, not one bit. The only thing I missed really from high school was my friend group. I had an awesome group of friends. Uh, we hung out almost every single day. There were seven of us and we called ourselves the Mac Lads, which was just the first letter of all of our names put together because that's what you did when you were in high school. You came up with cool names for your friend group. <laughs> and for us, it was either the Mac Lads or the Sad Clams. And so we decided to go with Mac Lads. We thought that sounded cooler. Uh, but after high school, we all went to different colleges. So when I got to college, I had the task of trying to make new friends, except I am terrible at making friends. I'm really bad at it. The only reason I have friends now is because I'm married to Kathleen and she is awesome at making friends. <laughs> so my typical day in college was I would wake up and I would decide if I'm gonna go to my morning class, probably not. And then I would go eat lunch by myself. And then I would go bowling by myself. I got really good at bowling. And then I would decide if I was gonna to go to my afternoon class, again, probably not. And then I would go back to my dorm and I would play Guitar Hero by myself. I got really good at Guitar Hero also. Uh, and then on the weekends, I would go home and my mom would do my laundry and that was my college experience, which is really sad when I say it out loud to a group of people. Um, <laughs> now, I am incredibly introverted and honestly, a day of nothing but bowling and Guitar Hero by myself. It sounds pretty amazing right now, right? Uh, but eventually, even for someone as introverted as I am, you just get lonely. And it was after nearly two years of this loneliness that I was dragged to a Bible study that I absolutely did not want to go to. And I hated every second of it, did not want to be there. But after the Bible study was done, a guy named Chris, who was the leading, by, leading the Bible study, he cornered me and struck up a conversation with me. And we started talking about music and he found out I owned a guitar and he invited me to come jam with his worship band. He was a leader of a worship band and they had practice that Wednesday. And he said, you should come and, you should come and jam with us. Uh, even though I was absolutely terrible at the guitar. And what I didn't realize at the time was that Chris was not looking for another guitarist for his worship band. Literally anyone else would have been a better option. What Chris was doing was he was looking for a way to get me plugged in to his community. He was looking for a way to meet my needs. And I actually showed up to the worship band practice that week, which looking back, I'm convinced was an act of the Holy Spirit. Because when you're as introverted as I am, just showing up to things is difficult, even when you've been personally invited. Like if you've ever had to cancel plans with an introvert, don't feel bad, you probably made their day. Don't stop inviting us to things though. Like we want to be included. Invite us to things, just know that we don't want to go to that thing. Right? <laughs> but at this band practice, I uh, met another guy there named Mike and he and I instantly hit it off. And he quickly became one of my best friends and eventually the guy that discipled me. And within the span of a week, I went from being isolated and lonely to spending most of my free time at a church with Christians which was crazy for me. And they never scared me with the threat of hell to try to get me to sign on the dotted line. They never tried to convince me with fancy arguments or debate me into submission. I never felt like I had to pretend to be something other than I was. I never felt accused. I never felt judged. I never felt condemned. What I did feel was welcomed. They made me feel like I belonged there. They made me feel worthy of their love, of their time, of their attention, even when a lot of times deep down, I felt like I didn't deserve it. And that is grace. That is advocacy. They saw a need in me and they met that need. And the Holy Spirit worked through them to transform me into a follower of Jesus Christ. And I'm thankful 
every single day. And so, thank you. So the question I want you to be thinking about right now is who is your Adam? Who is that person in your life who you know doesn't know the love of Jesus, who doesn't know the joy and the freedom and the community that comes with following Jesus? And how can you meet that person's needs? How can you be their advocate? Just think about the resources that God has blessed you with. How can you creatively use those resources to meet the needs of others? If you have an abundance of money, awesome, good for you. There are so many people in our community right now who are drowning in things like medical bills, things they shouldn't be drowning in, and they are praying for any kind of relief. And God has given you the resources to answer those prayers. We are the hands and feet of Jesus. It's time for us to get to it and start answering some prayers. Or maybe you have extra time on your hands. Awesome. Go talk to a representative in the Bridging Center out in the Center Court West Atrium. They would love to get you connected to families that you can love and serve and build relationships with. Or maybe right now you, you're feeling that sting of conviction because you're realizing that you may have, may have been a voice of accusation in someone else's life. Maybe at the time you thought it was righteous and good, but you're now realizing you are more of an accuser than an advocate. So maybe your next step is to repent and then to go ask that person for forgiveness and figure out a way how you can rebuild a relationship with that person and become their advocate, meet their needs. And remember, we're not out here trying to be superheroes. We serve others, we meet the needs of others so that we can build relationships with them, so we can bring them into our community, so we can love them with the divine love of Jesus. Because it is the radical love of those who follow Jesus that will show the world that Jesus is for real. So the question that we need to be asking ourselves as we resync our lives to bear witness to the risen Christ is in my daily interactions with other people, am I choosing to look for ways to meet their needs or am I conditioned to judge them? Like, are we as a church going to continue to point the finger and blame and cast judgment and guilt and shame on people that we feel don't meet our moral standards or are we going to love and encourage and build up those people, serve those people, meet their needs. Today and every day after, we all have a choice to make. Are we going to be the voice of the accuser in this world or are we gonna be the voice of the advocate? Pray with me. Father, I'm just, I'm just so thankful again that you would love us so much, love us in a way that we can't really even comprehend that you would come here, that you would take on flesh and blood to be our advocate, to be our defender, to defeat our enemy that we were helpless against, to shed your own blood so that we would be found innocent of our accusations. Father, I pray that anyone here in this room right now that doesn't know you as their advocate, that doesn't know your victory, that doesn't know your freedom. I pray that right now your Holy Spirit is doing a transformative work in their life, a powerful work, the same work that you did in me to bring me to that worship band practice. And if that's you right now, if you're feeling that conviction, if you're feeling like you don't know him as your advocate, but you want to, right now, all you have to do is say, Jesus, I received your victory. Jesus, I... I want to know you. I want to follow you. I say yes to your free gift of grace and salvation. That's it. And Father, I pray that for those of us in this room who do know you, that you continue to teach us, help us discern what it means to be an advocate in this world. It can get so confusing. The lines can look so blurred to us. We need your wisdom. We need your helper, your Holy Spirit to help us be an advocate for those who are lost, for those who need you. So show us what that looks like. Give us your power to destroy the works of the devil in this world and push out his kingdom of darkness. Father, again, we're just so thankful. We love you. It's in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Welcome to Postscript. 
Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Welcome to Postscript. My name is Michael Sullivan, business administrator here at FaithBridge, and I'm joined by Adam McIntyre, who just brought us part four of our Resync series, a sermon titled Know Your Enemy. Thanks for being here, Adam. Of course. Thanks for having me. Well, we had a couple of questions that came in today. Okay. Uh, you talked a lot about evangelism today and how to share the gospel with others. This question came in. They said when they were taught to do evangelism, they were taught to lead uh, maybe with the problem of sin, sure. uh, that in order for someone to receive the gospel, they kind of first need to know that there's a problem. Right. Uh, what would you say to that? Is that still an effective form of evangelism, or, uh, or how does that contrast to what you were sharing with us today? Sure. Uh, well, first, I think that most people, not all, but most people inherently know that there's just something off about the world and even there's something broken within themselves that's not whole, that's not right, that's missing. And I think a lot of times if you, as a stranger, just go and confront someone immediately with that truth, uh, and especially if they don't know you at all, you don't have any kind of relationship with them, uh, a lot of times it can just take people aback and their defenses instantly go up and there's no trust there at all, right? Mm -hmm. And really there's no reason for them to receive what you're saying mm -hmm. to them um, as truth, even if they may, might inherently deep down know it to be true, which is why uh, I think the first step in evangelism is, you know, get to know that person, find out what their needs are, mm -hmm. and then serve them and love them the way that Jesus did. And then as that happens, you start building relationships with them, you start building trust, and then ideally, uh, and this is how scripture says it works, as you're doing that, they will start to see Jesus in you. You become a witness to who Jesus is by your love for them, by your service uh, to them. And as that's happening, then you can slowly start sharing truth with them um, and you can let them know, hey, you can feel it. Things aren't the way they're supposed to be in the world and in your own life. Um, but uh, Jesus has come to repair, redeem those things in the world and in your life. And you can start sharing those truths with them. I, I think that's, the better way to do it, that's a biblical model uh, mm -hmm. for it. And so, sure. uh, again, we're not ignoring that truth. We're not saying that we're not broken. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely true. But it's the way in which we go about um, speaking that truth to others. Sure. Thanks for that insight. Uh, the second question that came in was, you, you talked a lot about accusation. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this person's asking, where's the line between accusation and maybe discipline? Sure. You know, if I see someone who's living a life of, of sin and I feel like I need to confront them, I don't want to be an accuser, but I also want to love them and, and confront their sin. Where is that line? Where does it kind of switch over between the two? Yeah, uh, that is a tough question um, because I think for all of us, the line between accuser and advocacy can get blurred. Uh, I think some of that is uh, can be attributed to our enemy um, who... Uh, again, can just make things confusing. Mm -hmm. um, I think, first of all, we need to determine the person that we're going to, that we're thinking about confronting, is that person a believer? Do they know Jesus? Mm -hmm. uh, if not, then we need to take a step back and think, am I about to accuse someone who uh, has no reason to, again, receive what I'm saying mm -hmm. um, and who's just going to see me as uh, another person telling them how bad and broken they are, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but if, if they are a follower of Jesus, um, then again, you have to consider, is what I'm about to tell them something that will move them towards life, that will move them towards uh, peace, those types of things, or is what I'm gonna tell them gonna push them away? Gonna, and, and sometimes that it's difficult to determine. Some people, mm -hmm. it, it's, uh, conviction doesn't sit well, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, with some people. And, and again, I think a lot of times in those situations, you also have to trust that the Holy Spirit will do that work of conviction mm -hmm. and transformation. Uh, and things like that. And so, um, but we are called as uh, brothers and sisters in Christ to help keep one another in check, to help help keep one another accountable. So I mm -hmm. think if you see a brother and sister uh, in Christ living in sin, uh, doing something sinful, then yeah, I think you should mm -hmm. point it out to them. They might be blind to it. They might not be aware of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you let them know, hey, I see this happening. I see this. Uh, it's going to hurt you. It's going to hurt someone else. And mm -hmm. uh, we're called to something better than that. And so let me help you yeah. with that. Um, 
but again, that's the key. I think let me help you. Let's yeah. let's tackle this together instead of hey, you're wrong, you're bad, repent, mm -hmm. uh, that kind of thing. But know? it's really entering into their shoes and saying I'm genuinely caring about you that's as right. a person. I think sometimes when we enter into those conversations, we might have a bent towards pride yeah. of. I know that you're doing something wrong and let me help sure. you discover it, you know, versus, no, I genuinely care for this person. I want good for them and entering in that way. That's uh, right. Like you said. That's so, good word. Yeah. well, thanks for a good word. And thank you for joining us on Postscript. We'll be back next week with Pastor Ken, who's going to wrap up the Resync series. So make sure and join us for that. We'll see you next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org slash postscript.